we'll be talking about uh, one of the greatest psalms, and why <laughs> one of the greatest exegesis of, of this psalm, Miserere May Deus. So we have this situation that David realized that um, he really has uh, sinned <laughs> uh, after, uh, after the sin with Bathsheba and after the, uh, the Nathan came, he realized, okay, it was a great scene, uh, it was very in injustice. Um, so, uh, first, I will show maybe the references, something what we do in the end, generally. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, it works, okay. Okay, so I uh, have chosen uh, to refer to mm, only on <laughs> only these uh, texts. Uh, we have, as you see, uh, some essays uh, and very important book that should be presented <laughs> during this uh, book presentation. So the book containing the essays of Father Roszak, Father Mruz, uh, and the translation of Father Stramski. Uh, so, so let's remember about it. Also, Farrell, Selva, uh, Ginter, and other uh, papers of Father Roszak. Uh, what problems should we address here? Uh, generally, we have the psalm and the commentary. Uh, we should ask um, what strategy Thomas adopted, because in fact uh, we have some text uh, which can have uh, can have many purposes. It can be just a scientific text, for example. Thomas could write something to communicate with other theologians, for example. Uh, he could write a sermon. But let, uh, let's try to uh, consider uh, what was the real pur purpose of this text. And uh, it's combined with the strategy of this text, and we will consider it here. Um, mm, I propose for two hypotheses. One is rather... Um, general, and we, I think we all share this opinion, yeah, that this text was, had um, educational reasons in a way that it was written uh, or as a reportage after the lecture, or maybe, I think we should, shouldn't ex exclude this uh, possibility, as some notes that can be used afterwards uh, for the lecture. Uh, but the second hypothesis, which is stronger in a way that uh, we claim much more in it. Uh, and I, I want yeah, to <laughs> try to argue uh, for, for this hypothesis, is that even more that um, Aquinas used the psalm and used his own exegesis uh, as a tool for Christian education. Yeah, that he used it to, uh, for somehow, <laughs> introduce to his students some general, general theological uh, message. Um, I think uh, it, it has a great significance from the point of view of, of hermeneutics of, of the text to establish what was the strategy and what was the real purpose of the text. And uh, I offer in this presentation three steps. First, let's just uh, go for a while into the text to see this strategy general strategy, then we will uh, move outside uh, and try to uh, gather some arguments for this first uh, hypothesis. Uh, and it will be, I think, easy because we all know more or less these arguments. And then we will, in the fir third step, go again into the text uh, to show some passages that, in my opinion, should convince us that uh, he wanted to use this exegesis as a tool of Christian education. So let's start. Mm, okay, I take it off. <coughs> uh, what, what is this strategy? At first, mm, like in every commentary to the psalm, uh, Aquinas gives us a general information about the psalm. For example, we have uh, information uh, about the uh, number 50, and he shows no, 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 it's an <laughs> intermission. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I thought maybe let's not uh, disturb 
uh, <laughs> the talk by, by, by the slides, yeah? If you had faith, you would see it. Uh, that's right, that's right. <laughs> I agree completely. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, we have something, some information uh, about, for example, number uh, 50. He says it's a number of jubilee. So, the time when uh, the, the debits are remitted, so the scenes are remitted. So, he shows that uh, it's compliant with the um, content of the psalm, of the situation. Uh, this psalm is uh, about remitting sins and about mercy. Um, now we have the problem because for us it's 50, 51st, <laughs> yeah, so it doesn't work <laughs> anymore. <laughs> uh, th then uh, the second part of this strategy is the structure, we know it. As everywhere we have this divisio textus. Yeah? Uh, and the third st part of strategy, so decision of uh, uh, Aquinas, if, is of course to follow the text passage by passage, this lectio continua, uh, but it's also um, his choice. Yeah? He could do something else. I will uh, address this topic later. Um, and um, what is very, very important to me uh, from, the part of, uh, from the point of view of the strategy is that he reduces references extremely. Please have a look on this slide. Only one reference to Biasius, one to Pseudo Dionysius, two references to Augustan, Augustine, two for, uh, three, three to Augustine, two to uh, Confessiones and one to um, uh, the Civita Dei. And uh, six to the gloss. Um, so we will treat afterwards the gloss like something, mm, some another topic. Uh, and look that we have, if I'm not wrong, 156 uh, references to the Holy Scripture. Yeah. So uh, we see that we have a great, um, let's say, biblical entanglement. Uh, why? Uh, of course, uh, we know we know this. Uh, we were talking about this uh, uh, approach to read the Bible through the Bible, uh, locum ex loco, like F uh, Father Roshak mm, shows us. Um, we can also uh, address the opinion of uh, Ginter that there are, that Aquinas wanted to show these divine roots of the text. Uh, we have this uh, opinion here. He does not seek to transform the Psalter into a philosophical book, but rather seeks to treat it as a source of di divine revelation. This is it. Uh, but also, it's very important to go back to the mm, premium prologue uh, for the mm, exposition of the Psalms, where he says that uh, Psalms contain all theology and, this, and all the whole scripture. We have whole theology, whole scripture in uh, Psalms. So let's use this whole scripture to explain the Psalms. Yeah? So I, I think it, this is very, very important to um, argue why he chooses to have this biblical entanglement that we have these 156 references. Uh, going back to Gloss, of course, uh, we are not talking about um, Glossa Ordinaria, um, but the Gloss uh, of Peter Lombard. Yeah, just just a remark. Uh, now let's go to back to the quoted authors. Uh, oh, for why? Sorry. Yeah, uh, why he chooses um, them? Uh, what what is his purpose to use them? Uh, he uses Boethius and Dionysius um, to support the thesis that um, divine substance is equal to the divine goodness. Yeah, so uh, something very important for Thomas, uh, that in God, everything is this, the same. It's the one uh, um, God's substance. Uh, then he uh, needs to refer to Augustine to um, support the thesis that uh, if we do not sin, as righteous men, perhaps, <laughs> uh, we do not sin because of God's mercy and grace. Uh, second thing, that little children uh, can also be s uh, sinful. 
And finally, that uh, external sacrifice uh, can be the effect of internal sac sacrifice. So he has some thesis and wants to support them by referring to, um, to these theologians. Um, and <coughs> uh, there are questions uh, why, she, why he needs such a sp special support to refer to them. Uh, my hypothesis is that uh, perhaps those theses, especially about th this uh, divine substance and equalness to, to goodness and so on, maybe it's not in the mainstream theology in these times, uh, especially in Naples, uh, among the students uh, in Naples. So perhaps it's something new, I don't know, maybe correct me. Uh, but he wanted to give the special support from the authorities like Boetius and Dionysius. Um, but perhaps let's not <laughs> exclude such an argument that maybe j he just kept them in mind because he likes them. <laughs> uh, these are the authors uh, that uh, are most often uh, quoted in Summa Theology, for example. Yeah? So he, he really appreciated them much. Uh, but maybe uh, we can adopt another uh, hypothesis that Aquinas uh, planned to um, supplement this text later. So uh, it was a reportatio and he planned to revise it and then uh, give some more uh, references we, we don't know. Uh, but we, we may also ask, uh, is it, was it needed to give more? Perhaps not. This text is so densely uh, woven by uh, these uh, very brief explanations and uh, passages from the scripture is very, very dense, so maybe there was no place to, uh, to put another uh, references and no need. Okay, um, next step when we are talking about the strategy. Uh, we have only uh, reference to the commentary to the gloss of Lombard. Why only Lombard? Why not? other commentaries. Um, perhaps we should say that he neglected the, the tradition. But Father Roshak sh <laughs> says to us, hmm, uh, see that he in fact includes, we have no references uh, uh, beyond that, those, uh, to the authorities, but in fact he includes authorities and his aim is to rework the tradition uh, in order to make it clear for uh, 13th uh, century students and theologians. So, update. Um, but uh, Father Roshak mentions only mm, about uh, the opinion of uh, Martin Morard, who said uh, that, in fact, Aquinas made a great commentary to the Lombard's uh, gloss. So, it's not very original. He's confined by uh, um, Lombard very much. But uh, Father Roshak says also that uh, Aquinas really took into to account uh, this distinguished theologians, uh, so this tradition is very, very uh, present here. Uh, how we can answer this problem, this question? I think through Lombard's gloss, um, Thomas refers to the whole tradition as in the gloss, we have generally uh, quotations from Augustine, Cassiodorus, uh, and, and others. Yeah, um, and also uh, Glossa Ordinaria, which also has a lot of uh, quotations on generally quotations. <laughs> um, but le let us also remember that in in other psalms, uh, Aquinas refers uh, to Augustinus directly. Mm, and he, he, uh, he refers to the Enarationis in Psalm. Uh, let's see uh, an example. Mm, yeah. Posumus literec David mutat tempora. Augustinus aliter solvit. From Psalm 21 and from the same Psalm. Sed dicit in medio ecclesia quod Augustinus sic exponit dites primo sic. Yeah. So uh, in a Psalm 50. Nothing, but uh, in other psalms we, we can uh, find something. And the last uh, step when we talk about um, the strategy, Thomas provides us um, 
several variants of translations. So uh, in the end of the psalm, we almost, uh, he includes the fact uh, that uh, this psalm is translated in three ways. Let's have a look. Yeah. The basic one is et in peccato concepit me mater mea, but then he says we have something else also, uh, alia litera habet, ait me mater mea, and alia litera habet, peperit me mater mea, yeah. in peccatis, of course. Uh, so it, it's very, very important that he wants to um, show to the listener that, look, we have three uh, free ways of translation take into account all of it. So for me, it's like uh, not only a um, uh, scientific approach, but he teaches, look, ha have this all. Yeah? Remember about those three uh, variants. Uh, the second step, so um, this external, let's say, analysi uh, analysis, uh, which shows um, this uh, educational approach uh, from the first hypothesis. <coughs> uh, we know the history, perhaps. Yeah? So, uh, as Torel says, uh, Thomas came to Naples, uh, perhaps in 1272, uh, to teach uh, there, to um, organize the Studium Generale from the, uh, from the normal school. Um, and, it is commonly shared opinion uh, that he, he wanted to comment on this psalm and then, then teach it. Yeah? So, mm, in a way, we are quite convinced uh, that uh, it was in, in this way a, a tool of education. But I think we need some uh, supporting arguments either. Uh, let's um, take into account that, in fact, uh, a bit earlier, in 1265, he started his educational mission. I read it in, a w in this way. Uh, it was a similar situation he, when he came to Rome uh, to also organize a Studium Generale. Yeah? Uh, and he realized that he cannot teach basing, for example, on his commentary to the sentences. It's, it's, it's useful there. And then he decided to after Torel, uh, to write the Summa Theologium. Yeah? And uh, we know it very, very well, this passage, this proemium of Summa Theologia, but I, <laughs> I want to invite, it, uh, invite you to chew it again, what we have here. Um, it, it has to be addressed to the beginners, but two, two days ago I, I realized that we have this opposition, not only that is for beginners, but it, it's not for professionals. It's not for, for professional theologians. Yeah? And there we, s we see that he's fed up with uh, this ol old way of educating, um, uh, using the old materials is even harmful for, for students. Uh, so he needs a new textbook, so he tries to start work uh, to, to pre prepare it, to prepare own materials. We, we see here, I think, this anger, the, with this tiredness and anger. Um, uh, so, uh, since that time, I think we can see that Thomas is much more uh, involved in educational thinking to prepare materials. So, this, is, th this can be another argument, supporting argument, that he will write rather for students some textbooks maybe, um, for educational purposes. Mm, we can also form an argument about complementary work that uh, he, he uses, as, let's have a quotation uh, from Ginter again, that he uses uh, commentary and psalms as a textbook, uh, and of course uh, still he Mm, adopts this information to, to the sum, for example. Um, and we can also call the arguments just from Ginter, 
who says, uh, uh, contrary to the common view, <coughs> the textbook for theology was not the sentences of Lombard, but rather the Bible. Yeah. So also Aquinas will teach theology basing on the Bible. And now uh, the main part of, of my presentation, this internal analysis, when we say that uh, uh, on this basis that um, the commentary was a tool perhaps of Christian education. But first, uh, two, remark, two, two remarks. Mm. When we ask what is this text like, uh, we see that it's not, as I said, scientific work. And we can compare it to the commentary of Aquinas to um, the, the Trinitata of Boethius. There, we see it's a kind of scientific work because he is not uh, commenting passage by passage. This is one thing. Uh, and he just chooses some specific problems in, uh, in this commentary to Boethius. Uh, he's talking, in fact, about the methodology of knowledge, of, of science, what, what sciences are, and so on. And he stops in a moment, in the third part, and does not continue. <laughs> yeah? He abandons the Boethius. It means that he took this text and wanted to share some ideas with theologians. Uh, whereas, uh, uh, if he wanted to show it to the students, he will uh, comment passage by passage, and this is the way he, he is following uh, in a commentary to the psalm. Um, and, of course, in this commentary to the psalm, we have no discussion. He, he does not discuss anything, any problems, just explaining. Um, and of also, we can say that this text is for sure not a sermon. Uh, we can compare it, uh, for example, to the uh, commentary of Augustine to, the, uh, to the, this psalm. Uh, one thing that it's, an, it's titled a sermon, but when we uh, have this internal analysis of the text, we, say, we see that in Augustine we have um, you know, all these rhetorical measures, uh, like repetitions, uh, like questions and answers. Yeah, like uh, saying, just write to the listener, you. Yeah? There are some examples. Um, Quo merito? Medicus est. Offert meritedem. Deus est. Offert sacrificium. Quo dabis ut munderis? Vida enim quem in voces. Justum invocas od is peccata, si justus est. Vindicat in peccata, si justus est. Non poteris offer a dominus Deus justitia meius. Yeah? Questions, answer, repetitions, and so on some rhetorical measure. It's a sermon. Uh, we don't have such a things in, uh, in Aquinas' uh, commentary. Fine. Uh, now, the proofs, <laughs> finally. Let's see the text itself. Uh, so, we have some uh, general explanations, some uh, passages from the Bible, and finally, some doctrin doctrinal uh, message. For example, notandum, est notandum. So please note this <laughs> down or, or just uh, think about it very, very carefully. Quot aliquid potest sperare de misericordia divina duplici ratione. So now some doctrinal message. Let's consider the, um, the, the mercy, the divine mercy. What is it? And we can speak about it uh, in two ways. In one way is what I mentioned before, uh, in God. And then see, we see that God is equal with his substance and some, his goodness, and his mercy, and so on. This is some extra message from uh, Aquinas to the students. He wants to teach them uh, and use, use it as an opportunity to teach about it. I read it in, it, in, in this way. Uh, mm, next, mm, next, let's say proof. <coughs> Another doctrinal message. Remanet uh, autem duplex effectus peccati. So now he is uh, selling <laughs> a message about uh, the sin yeah, and and the effects of the sin. Then he is, let's say, selling a message about blame or. Another translation, macula. Again, we have um, duo. 
mm, duo sunt necesare atât removendum maculam. So we have another theological distinction that he wants to, to teach about. And then we have also some pairs of opposition that he wants to sell to, to, to his students. Like uh, iniquitas is contraria justitie, peccatum vero munditie. Mm, very, very important thing. He teaches also about um, about the mm, original sin, and uses very, um, let's say, suggestive uh, words like radix and infectus. Yeah? Radix omnis culpe actualis is peccatum originale. Quod apparentibus contrahitur infectis illo peccato. Uh, Perhaps it's not needed to, to, to say about it, but he wanted to um, give this message. Uh, again, later we have something more about the uh, original scene, again. Uh, and let's briefly sk keep showing, uh, showing another examples. Again, sciendum est, so <coughs> read it, hear it carefully, yeah? Quod spirituale gaudium habet tres gradus. Another doctrinal message, gratia dititur benevolentia dei, so what is grace and so on. Then he shows for, uh, in other passage that uh, donum gratia datur per caritatem, et tale donum datur per spiritua, spiritum sanctum. Again, qui habet gratiam, habet caritatem, qui habet caritatem, amat deum, et habet ipsum. Et qui habet quod amat gaudet ergo ubi caritas ibi gaudium. Something again new from him. Uh, virtus inferior est sufficiens at mm, prebendum auxilium contra superiorem. Ergo contra diabolum indiget homo iuvari spiritu principali spiri, silicet principante et dominante super omnia. And to uh, last, notandum again. Uh, notandum est quod in reclectione fit triplex merito de spiritu, reatus sanctus principalis. And finally, triautem facit spiritus sanctus in homine, rectitudinem intentionis, sanctificat nos, nobilitat et facit nos principes. Again, some extra, extra message. So, uh, let's... Uh, mm, conclude. Uh, we see that um, this exegesis is in fact opportunity to teach some important informations and uh, distinctions uh, of Sacra Doctrina in fact. These are general uh, content of, of Sacra Doctrina of, of theology. Uh, let's sum it up. Uh, oh, maybe like. Uh, we, we, we should also have a, such a remark that we have many passages about uh, from the field rather of uh, psychology, not only uh, theology, but just a small remark. Yeah, we, we should remember about it. Um, and let's sum it up. W what content from Sacra Doctrina Thomas delivers here in this commentary? Yeah, we have <coughs> uh, something about God's essence. about the concept of mercy, blame sin, removing them, original sin, spiritual joy and its steps, uh, God's good will and its relations with grace and human goodness, relations between love, grace and joy, practical spiritual consequences of the levels of powers, three types of spirit, effects of the Holy Spirit's action in, in human. Yeah, so quite much. I, I think, as for, uh, for uh, just an uh, explanation what's what's in the, in the psalm. Um, the last remark, le let's go uh, back to these three authors. We said that we have only three authors, but when we uh, see this exegesis in a light that it was uh, to, to teach, we now, uh, it's obvious that we have only three because uh, if Thomas gave more, the students wouldn't remind anything, I think. <laughs> wouldn't um, uh, perhaps also understand it. So he did it not to confuse, not to bring a confusion to the minds of readers, uh, as, we, as we have seen before uh, in, a, in a prologue to Summa. 
Uh, maybe this is the explanation. So, to conclude, we have four, oh sorry, <coughs> four conclusions, um, and I would like to ask, uh, I would like you to, I would like <laughs> to invite you to, to discuss it. Uh, first, I think uh, we have really strong arguments for the hypothesis I presented before, this stronger one, uh, that uh, Aquinas really wanted, really decided to use this exegesis as a tool also for Christian educa education, uh, as we have seen. Um, the second uh, conclusion is that this more specific hypothesis is in fact, um, uh, yeah, it's more specific than this general, and, but it's in, in fact within this first hypothesis. Uh, the third conclusion is that mm, this stronger hypothesis that I, that I tried to prove here uh, has some strong explanatory power. First, it shows uh, some uh, Aquinas pedag pedagogical uh, practice and it can be an argument against uh, the one author I, I mentioned here who said that it's just uh, not original rather text, uh, just a commentary to the Lombard. Uh, one thing that I checked it, that it's not true al al also from this reason that when we compare uh, the biblical um, passages quoted in Lombard and then in uh, exposition of made by Aquinas, this is completely different. I mean, Thomas takes nothing from Lombard as far as uh, biblical passages are concerned, nothing. Everything is new. So one thing, we can see that he's original here, but also he's uh, original uh, as someone who treats as a Jesus as a tool for Christian education for Sacra Doctrina. And finally, um, Let's see that um, this hypothesis is compliant with uh, this uh, Aquinas' assumption that Psalms contain whole theology. Yeah? When, when we remind this, whole theology is in Psalms. So, to teach theology, let's use them. And I think if it's true, if this hypothesis is true, it's quite a good idea. So, thanks to... St. Thomas Aquinas, and thank to you for your patience. Thank you.